Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 10th day of the online seminars in psycholinguistics. I am Pamela Toassi, and together with Professor Mayusi Mota, I would like to thank you all for being with us today. The seminars are being organized by LabLing, the Language and Cognitive Processes Laboratory, coordinated by Professor Mayusi Mota, and affiliated with the graduate program in English and the graduate program in linguistics at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And Plibimulti, the bilingual and multilingual language processing research group co coordinated by me and affili is affiliated with the graduate program in translation studies at the Federal University of Ceará. Today we have the honor to welcome Professor Dr. Ana Schwartz from the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at El Paso, USAT, right? So Dr. Anna Schwartz received her PhD in Cognitive Psychology under the mentorship of Dr. Judith Kroll in 2003, and in 2004 completed postdoctoral work on bilingual speech processing under the supervision of Dr. David Pisoni. So her research examines the cognitive nature of bilingual comprehension processes. In this way, she has had opportunities to investigate the complex dynamics of bilingual language processing across modalities and across school-age children. Carries out her research through eye tracking, button press, reaction time paradigms, as well as more naturalistic reading and recall paradigms. Her earlier work focused on processes of lexical access and how these are influenced by cross-language interactions. More recently, she has turned her attention to discourse processing and a deeper understanding of what it means for a language to be selected or inhibited. Although most of her research has used the laboratory settings, the findings have critical implications for pedagogy and reading education. So during the talk, as always, you can post questions and comments to the chat, and I'll pass them on to Professor Anna Schwartz at the end of the talk. So again, Professor Anna Schwartz, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to participate in the online seminars in psycholinguistics. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for attending and a special shout out to my first and former student, Ana Fontes. I know you're out there. Um, she helped me start this all. So I guess I will start to share my screen, right? So I will share my PowerPoint here. Okay. All right. So this was uh, a really enjoyable experience preparing this talk. And it was enjoyable because I've now been at UTEP for 15 years, which to me sounds like a very long time. And it gave me this opportunity to synthesize together and kind of knit together in a quilt and see the big picture of what my research, you know, its overall theme. And it was beautiful to see a theme and it's giving me inspiration of where I want to go next. Okay, so Let's start off, we're going to learn, for some, there'll be some new concepts to learn. So there's lots, uh, but I will make it very accessible and clear. So there's something that I have to highlight, and that is that I work in the context of the United States. And the United States in many ways is an anomaly. Um, just like most countries where the official language is English, because um, English is now the language of um, commercialism and we're, increasingly globalized, you will find if you look across the globe that those countries for which English is the official language have a, a weird proportion of people who are monolinguals. And that does not represent most of the world. And the United States is a particular anomaly because not only um, is it monolingual, but it's also an economic superpower. And there are, as in any country, many um, contextual disparities that exist between um, different new immigrant populations as they come in. And so you might be aware of the fact that the United States has enjoyed a large influx lately of immigrants from um, countries where the, the language spoken is Spanish. And unfortunately, what happens through history is initially immigrant groups do um, have lower social economic status and the associated consequences. 
And so because of that, early research on bilingualism in the United States um, saw bilingualism as a bad thing, as, as if it was something to be avoided, as if it was a cognitive problem, which to us today with what we know seems outrageous, but this wasn't that long ago. And that's what's disturbing. Um, a seminal study, if you think about it, I know it's 2020, but I don't think 1963 was that long ago. And so in a seminal study, Peel and Lambert, they dared, dared suggest that not only is bilingualism not a bad thing, but they had evidence that bilingual children outperformed monolinguals. So this was, you know, ground shaking and it opened up this whole new um, framework of how we understand bilingualism. And really, I want to really highlight that this is still an emerging understanding. There still are um, misconceptions, particularly by lay people um, from the general public that, you know, they're worried that their children will be confused if they're exposed to more than one language in the household. So why would there be a cognitive benefit to being bilingual? Well, if you think about it, turns out bilinguals are jugglers. So if you speak more than one language proficiently, and I will put aside the issue of what do we mean by proficient, congratulations, you're a juggler relative to someone who does not speak more than one language proficiently. And there are a variety of reasons why you are juggling. First of all, we have research, and this is really recent research. So this type of research came out when I was a graduate student. It was the hottest topic. It was in the 90s, which to me seems like yesterday. Um, we know now that the languages of a bilingual are in continuous interaction, even when we're not aware of it. Many bilinguals like to say, oh, yeah, I notice when my English gets in the way of my Portuguese. No, we're talking about continuous interactions, even when we are not aware of it. And one thing we know from especially this work that came out in the 90s, is, um, and even though I focus on comprehension, this is also true in production. When bilinguals communicate in just one language, as far as they know, they're just engaging one language. The truth of the matter is both of their languages are active in parallel. It is very clear from the research that the cognitive system of a bilingual, that mental system, does not have an on and off switch. It's not like when you go to withdraw money from a ATM, where in the United States you can select your language. And yeah, that doesn't work here. It's always interacting. So what we have is, you, if you think about it, it's beautiful. The cognitive system is fundamentally open. There's no hard borders or border fences. And this allows the bilingual cognitive system to be based on a system, you wanna think of it, as a continual opportunity for an exchange of information. Okay, so an overview of what I will attempt to cover. Um, if I don't cover all of these things, that is fine. Um, a philosophy that guides my science as well as my instruction in the classroom is I like to keep constant depth of coverage, even if that means sacrificing breadth. So this is a potential of what we'll cover but I don't want to talk too fast. I care more about depth. Okay, so one study I will cover is some early research where we showed that bilinguals, if they learn a strategy in one language, it automatically transfers to their other language. And in that particular study, we adopted an applied classroom reading strategy type paradigm. I will also cover a study in which we discovered that for bilinguals, bilinguals can benefit from a little uh, boost in processing speed when their languages are co-activated in parallel. And in that particular study, we used a very different type of approach. It was a study based on you know, basic lab research and we used eye tracking. So that's very different than classroom research. And then um, one of our audience members, Ana Fontes, I give her the credit for this study, still one of my favorites. Um, we did a study where we discovered that bilinguals, by virtue of having two languages that interact, they develop richer, more complex um, representations of word meanings than those who do not speak more than one language. 
And in that study, we also used a very kind of lab approach, basic cognitive research, but sometimes you don't have to rely on fancy technology. It was basically a paper and pen study, which is great to know in the times of um, quarantine and COVID because now we can't do eye tracking. So it's back to paper and pen type studies. And then the most recent study, and I don't know if I'll have time to get to it. This is um, a, a study that I'm currently writing up for submission for publication, um, where my most recent graduate student um, had a passion for education. And so her dissertation was very focused on trying to speak to what it's like for the bilingual in the classroom. And in that study, she discovered that um, proficient bilinguals can readily integrate information across different sources, like different texts or magazines, even when they're written, it's the same if they're written in the same language or in different languages. And there we had an opportunity. This study is particularly beautiful because it incorporated everything. It had an applied perspective, but it also spoke to basic science. And we did a combination of paper pen type responses but also eye tracking. So that study is particularly exciting. Okay, so what we'll do is I think next we're gonna talk about um, this first study on the transfer of how strategies transfer across the bilinguals two languages. And I want you to think about a bilingual, and I say bilingual for simplicity. Um, let's not forget there are many people who are polyglots, um, people in Switzerland who speak, you know, who knows how many languages and in Holland, it's beautiful, right? So I'm just saying bilingualism, but this applies to multilingualism. See, and I want you to think about the multilingual speaker of having just combined resources, more than one avenue of input, more than one avenue for learning. And um, I feel this is particularly well demonstrated through this study um, conducted, I guess now a while ago, um, we were interested in whether you know, in cognitive psychology, we talk about um, basic semantic knowledge versus procedural knowledge. And so strategies that we use to learn. So when you're when you, there's many graduate students in the audience, when you have to read a difficult science paper, um, I'm sure you're not just reading. You have some sort of strategy you're using to try and encode that information. And a strategy is a set of procedures. And so we were curious to see if even procedural type knowledge, if it's acquired or if a new procedure is acquired through instruction in just one language, would bilinguals spontaneously use that procedure when given the opportunity in the other language? And um, in monolingual research here in the United States, um, there's been a, a lot of support for the efficacy of a particular strategy and it's called the text structure strategy. And the text structure strategy has been shown to improve not just comprehension, but especially recall for um, texts. And many readers actually use the text structure naturally, but many do not as well. And text structure strategy, just because I don't have time to go in too much depth, it's a strategy in which one uses the particular structure used by an author. Let's say if an author is saying using cause effect, they use cause effect as they encode the information and then they use that same structure to later recall it. And there's just tons of evidence that this strategy works and everyone benefits from this instruction and practice. So there's been so many studies showing that improves recall for older adults also younger adults, so even graduate students who are in their peak cognitive speed of life, you know, it's a beautiful time. Most graduate students are in their 20s, most of them, I know not all, you're in peak cognitive power time. Um, this strategy also works for that age range. It works for children. I learned this strategy. I was a student of Meyer, who's the third author here, who um, created this strategy. I took her class. I did not think it would improve my recall, and it did. Okay, so we wanted to ask, We basically we were going to teach this structure strategy to bilinguals. Now I live here on the border, I do my research here on the US-Mexico border. I live right on the border with Juarez. And um, 
UTEP has about 10 to 15 percent of our students are international students who commute every day, come across the bridge and attend UTEP. And you will see that that was our um, target population that we recruited in this particular study. And first I'll tell you, um, this is for the people who are a little more experienced in reading information about the bilingual participants, feel free to look at the table while I talk. Um, if you're not so used to it, don't feel overwhelmed. I can summarize it for you easily. Um, the basic profile of the participants, typically they have acquired Spanish earlier, right from you know, the earliest ages. Um, and then you'll see that their age of acquisition is in adolescence, which for those of you who might not know, is pretty darn late. We consider that pretty darn late acquisition if it's not until um, adolescence. And then you can see we asked them to rate their proficiency, how well they felt their proficiency in their dominant language, native language Spanish versus English. And you can see quite a difference there. Um, so this is a typical profile of those students who are attending UTEP coming across the border. They went to high school in Juarez and now they're attending UTEP going back and forth across the border. Let me just take a sip. And I have a couple family members in the audience, so they might not know that L1 refers to dominant language. I'm going to be using that acronym and L2 refers to the weaker language. So put that into your vocabulary. Okay, the overall procedure straightforward. Um, they came in and we first pre tested them. We gave them some passages. They were expository passages and we asked them to recall them. So they did written recall protocols. And we pre-tested them in both of their languages, both in Spanish and English. Then we conducted the intervention. And the intervention is actually quite complex. Um, it takes, it's five sessions. Each session is two hours. And you try to do maybe two sessions a week. You don't want to clump them too close together. And there's all sorts of homework in between sessions. So it's a very detailed, um, well thought out strategy. And just to let you guys know, any cognitive strategy cannot be taught overnight. It is impossible. A strategy that works takes lots of practice. So that's why this intervention took over a week. And then afterwards, we would post test them on recall again in Spanish and English. So pretty straightforward. Okay, here's the key. We delivered instruction completely in English, their weaker language. With some exception, if there was some little clarification, we would allow a little bit of Spanish, otherwise all in English. And what was beautiful about this study um, was that these students would cross the border and sometimes wait two hours at the bridge to come for a two hour session. And later when the study was completed, they raved about how much it meant to them that they know that they had learned a lot. Um, and it was just beautiful to see people, you know, waiting at an international bridge two hours to come and improve their reading. Okay, so we then post tested them in both their languages. And so I'm going to hop right to results. Um, there's different types of uh, outcomes that we can look at from instruction in this strategy. And one particular dimension we look at is we look at their, their actual recall that which they written, which they write out. And we have a scoring system that reflects, did they use the structure of the text in how they organize their recall? And the higher the number, the higher the score, that means the more that they did use the author's structure in how they recalled the information. Okay, so let's look at this graph. What you have along the y-axis is the overall structure use score. So the higher the bar, the more they use the author's structure in how they organize their recall. Along the x-axis, we have the language of recall. White bars represent the scores at pretest, and black bars represent scores at post-test. And this data is just beautiful. Um, so you can see in their dominant language, they have, now this is really cool, remember they were not instructed in Spanish, but what you see here is they are definitely using the structure strategy more at post-test in Spanish. 
Um, also, you can see a huge leap, <laughs> a huge leap in English. So they were not using the strategy as much in their second language when they first came to the lab and then boom, they started using it quite a bit. So we do see a use of the strategy, increased use. Now we have quality of recall. And for this, what we do is we look back and we look at um, what they recall, the content, and we count up the number of idea units from the text that were recalled. So it's basically how much of the information did they recall? And this is one of my favorite graphs of all time. So this is lovely. Um, I want you to, uh, so yeah, the greater the number, the more they recalled. So the bigger the bar, more recall. What should jump out right away, remember English is their second and weaker language, is look at that leap, okay? This is after a week and a half. Look at that leap in recall from pre to post test. It's huge. Another thing I love about this is we almost leveled the playing field. Look at the English post test score. It's now similar to their native language at pretest. And that was just after a week and a half. I mean, it's a lot of hours crossing the border, but clearly this has had a meaningful impact in their ability to recall information from a text. And it transferred spontaneously into Spanish. And so um, that's pretty neat to see as well. Um, here's a visualization that we actually have in the publication because it was so it was just visually obvious. This is an example of one participant's recall at pretest. That's panel A. Panel B is post test. You could just visually see how much more they're recalling after they participated in the strategy. Okay, so that's um, the first study that shows how two languages can be multiple resources, multiple avenues of input, strategies transfer across languages. And then I want to point out with a brief summary of another study that bilinguals and of course multilinguals have unique tools because their cognitive system is fundamentally different than that of monolinguals. Okay, so first one thing that we should etch in stone is that bilinguals are not simply two monolinguals in one. Um, for bilinguals, the representations of words and their meanings are stored in a single integrated memory system, in a single lexicon. And because of that, when bilinguals encounter words in just one of their languages, the truth of the matter is that there is automatic flow of activation throughout the entire lexicon, throughout the entire system, such that words across languages are activated in parallel. So it's a network of activation. So encountering a word in one language spreads activation to other similar words in the other language. Now, all of my examples are Spanish English, but they're going to be similar to the case of Portuguese English. So the circle here represents the, the mental dictionary, the lexicon, what we have in long term memory. And let's say someone, um, an English Spanish bilingual, sees the word out in the environment basic. What we know is that. Seeing that word will certainly send activation to its representation in long-term memory, but it will simultaneously in parallel um, activate other similar words, even if those words are in their other language, in this case, Spanish, básico. And básico, because it's so similar to basic, it sends activation, some more convergent activation back to basic. So what I want you to appreciate is that for bilinguals, uh, many of them, there's words across languages that are very similar. As a consequence, these words are recognized and processed more quickly. It's kind of like this cooperation across languages. In this case, you have two sources of input of evidence that this word is basic. You have it from the stimulus itself, but then you also have activation from words that are similar from the other language. And words that are similar like this, like basic, basico, or hotel in Spanish is hotel, taxi is taxi, we call those cognates. 
And one thing that we observe across many, many studies is that cognate words are processed more quickly than non-cognates. They are recognized more quickly. We see this across so many different types of tasks. We see it in comprehension. We also see it in production. We see it in language pairs like English and Spanish, which share an alphabet, but we also see it across languages that don't even share a writing system. So cognate facilitation is also observed for Mandarin Chinese English bilinguals as well, or Hebrew English. It's a very powerful effect. Um, I, my favorite phrase, I like to say, it's when effect is really robust and we see it everywhere, I say it's like cockroaches. Um, cognate facilitation effects are, are very robust and prevalent. And because they're so robust and prevalent, um, there's a gazillion studies that have shown um, facilitated processing of cognates. We wanted to go a step further because the evidence was, okay, cognate words themselves are recognized more quickly than non-cognates. And then I thought, since it's such a robust effect, does it have any other downstream effects? Does it kind of affect later processing? I wanted to know if this facilitated processing of cognates, if it would translate into facilitated processing of larger units, like for example, parts of a sentence or maybe an entire sentence. And so I want you to consider the two sentences I have up on, on, uh, on this slide here. And the, so in one of them, what you have is they both start with two nouns, a criminal and some hostages. But what I want you to appreciate is that later on there is a pronoun, okay? And if you wanna sound fancy, we call that an anaphor. For um, those who are not linguists out there, your pronouns are called anaphors. And what the reader has to do when they encounter that pronoun they have to figure out, okay, this is referring to something I've already seen, which one? And so in the first case, it's pretty clear. The reader sees that the pronoun in this case is singular, and so there's no ambiguity. The, the pronoun he must be referring to criminal. Alternatively, if it was they, they would know that they would have to be referring to hostages. Now, you are all proficient, highly educated readers. So we take this processing for granted. However, anaphoric referencing, that is figuring out what a pronoun is referring to, is cognitively costly. And um, all you have to do is watch a second grader read to see that these are not necessarily easy processes. Um, they take time to be honed. And in complex tasks, there can be significant slowing in reading rates when um, people have to make these um, connections between pronouns and the appropriate referent. So this is not um, cognitively easy, even though we think it is. And so my one of my recent graduate students and I did this study, we wanted to know, okay, since we know that this type of anaphoric referencing is cognitively costly, um, hmm, we wondered, could this process of going through memory when you find a pronoun and retrieving the possible referent, who is it referring? Maybe it's facilitated if the nouns in the beginning of the sentence are cognates relative to non-cognates. So basically we wanted to look beyond the cognate itself. Now in this particular example, in English and Spanish, criminal is a cognate. And so we had all the possible conditions. We had sentences where the nouns were cognates, were just or where neither one was a cognate or where just one of them was, all the possible conditions, but I don't have time to go through that. But I do wanna just summarize what we found. <clears throat> and this is, this is the first study to look at effects of cognate facilitation beyond the cognate itself. And what we found was that processing time overall was faster um, if at least one of the nouns in the sentence was a cognate. Now, we used eye tracking in this study, so we were able to compare how long participants took to read the first noun, the second noun, and later on the pronoun. And in fact, we found that the processing time of the pronoun, they were much faster um, if, there were, if the nouns in the initial part of the sentence were cognates. It suggests that those cognates were just more readily available in memory. 
And so in a way, bilinguals, bilinguals have these tools that are not really present for monolinguals. And um, you know, we're coming a long way from those days of saying that bilingualism might be a bad thing. Okay, now for a study that is also near and dear to my heart, my first born graduate student, Ana Fontes, who's in Brazil, um, this is a study she did. And she discovered that English Spanish bilinguals here on the border, thanks to the fact that their languages are always interacting. So we're gonna remember that the languages of a bilingual are always in continuous interaction. She discovered that a consequence of that, there's a long-term consequence and that is how bilinguals come to represent the meaning of words. Remember, we have these things called cognates and many language pairs have many, many cognates. Again, these are words that look very similar and basically mean the same thing. However, for example, if you take the, the cognate um, hotel, hotel in English and Spanish, the meaning is very clear. There's no differences, it's a, it's a hotel. But there's other words that are a little more abstract, like ambitious. And even though ambitious is a cognate with um, Spanish ambiciosa, there's different nuanced meanings across those languages. So if in Spanish you're called an ambiciosa, they're pretty much insulting you because they're saying you're kind of cutthroat. Whereas in English, to be ambitious is pretty awesome. And so bilinguals have to navigate this territory, right? So you can imagine English Spanish bilingual has a different concept of ambitious than a monolingual speaker of either language. And that's something that um, Anna discovered in this study. And so this is just a visualization, you know, of the difference between what it means to be ambiciosa in Spanish versus ambitious in English. And I'm not sure where, oh, and so the idea here is that if you're a bilingual, you don't have just, it's not all black and white. You have more of an integrated representation of ambitious that has to incorporate the ideas of being a, a go-getter, but oh, you know, this person might be cutthroat as well. Okay, so the types of words she used, and um, I don't know if she'll ever forgive me for how hard it was to find the words for this study. Um, so let's think of English. So here we have the word arms. Now, the most dominant meaning for the word arms in English is the body part. However, arms has another meaning in English. It's what we call a homonym because it has more than one meaning. So weapons is another meaning. Well, things get even more complicated if you're a bilingual of English and Spanish. In Spanish, we also have a word armas, looks a lot like arms. However, in Spanish, Armas can only mean weapons. That's it. And so Ana set about the task of trying to figure out if you're an English Spanish bilingual and you're exposed to this meaning, the body part meaning of arms, but thanks to the fact that you also speak Spanish, you kind of get a double dose of the weaker meaning. She wanted to know if the fact that being exposed to this weaker, less frequent meaning, but if you're getting it in both languages, maybe it makes that part, that meaning of the word be more prominent part of a bilingual's overall representation of arms. And so this is one of the best titles we ever came up with in our studies. I'm usually not good at cutesy titles, but we did a good job with that one on a different plane. And so we wanted to see if a lifetime of cross-language interactions means that bilinguals develop different concepts of words. And she used words such as arms, in which the weaker meaning, um, it's a homonym in English, but the weaker meaning is shared in Spanish, as well as a model. Model is another homonym. It has um, different um, meanings. And in this case, both meanings are shared with Spanish. Amen. Okay, so what she did, and I don't think we, I think this was by luck that we did this. Um, she was doing this study for a different reason, but then it became interesting, interesting in its own right. 
um, she wanted to replicate a previous study where we want to know for words that are homonyms, the way that we find out which meaning is more frequent is we just give these words to people, to participants. So we'll give uh, an English speaker the word arms or the word model or the word picture. And we'll just ask them to write a sentence with the first meaning that comes to mind. And then you take all those responses and you calculate which meaning was produced more frequently. Sometimes both meanings are produced equally frequently. Sometimes one meaning is produced a heck of a lot more frequently than the other. So for example, arms, the body part meaning will be produced a lot more frequently than the weapons meaning because it's just more common. However, all the norms of these words were based on monolingual responses. And so Anna began to collect data here on the border and to see, well, what about if the person, yeah, they're an English speaker and they're dominant in English, but they also are, speak Spanish. Is that gonna influence what type of meaning comes to mind first when they go to generate a sentence? And so they're just asked to write a sentence in response to the words that we gave them. Um, arms, it's the, in this case, we have a weaker meaning that's shared with Spanish. The weapons meaning is what's shared with Spanish. And by the way, the task was always in English, just English, only English. Um, another example homonym would be novel. Um, in English, the dominant meaning is a book, but there's another meaning, something that's unique. Novela in Spanish only means a book. So in this case, so some of the homonyms, the English homonyms, the more frequent meaning was shared in Spanish, like novel. But for the other half, the weaker meaning, the subordinate meaning was shared with Spanish. But again, remember, participants are coming and we're not even really mentioning their Spanish. Everything here is done in English. They're just asked to generate some sentences. And um, what we did was, El Paso as a border region is very complex. There's not just one type of bilingualism, there's probably 20 types of bilingualism here along the border. We tried to capture that by making a distinction between what you have along this border are some bilinguals who are very proficient in Spanish, who can study in Spanish or English and can read magazine articles in Spanish and English easily, both. Then you have those, and I think my son is now one of these, um, he's not proficient in Spanish, but he grew up here in the border. So he's been exposed to Spanish his entire life. And so you can kind of think of like his brain is somehow influenced by Spanish. And we collected both samples because we wanted to be able to have a group who wasn't bilingual, but at least was also exposed to the same type of local usages of words. So that's why we had two groups. Um, we divided the participants that we recruited here in El Paso into two groups. Those who were truly bilingual and those who maybe could ask where the bathroom is in a restaurant in Spanish, but were virtually monolingual, but from the same um, El Paso region. Okay, and that's important because then we're controlling for the sociolinguistic context. And we wanted to compare the probability that participants would generate a particular meaning of a homonym. And then we were going to compare that probability with the already published norms that were based on monolingual speakers of English. So we basically took their same stimulus, a published study, but now we gave them to our local samples. Very straightforward procedure. Hey, write a sentence with the first meaning that comes to mind. And then Anna did all the complex and analyses and metrics. And I didn't have to do any, but she did it for me. Um, and she calculated not just, she not only did she calculate the frequency with which one meaning was generated versus another, there's this beautiful measure of how, it's called the uncertainty measure. And it's a measure of how uncertain a meaning of a word is. So if you have a word like arms, because one meaning is so much more dominant in English than the other, there's some uncertainty, but it mostly means body part. You have a word like taxi, there's no uncertainty. Taxi means taxi. What if you have a word like pitcher? Oh, pitcher has a lot of uncertainty because it has these two meanings and they're kind of similar frequency. Something that you pour, 
and someone on a baseball mound. So she also calculated um, based on people's responses, how uncertain a meaning of a word was. And she compared that uncertainty measure for based on the probabilities, the productions of those English monolinguals from the published study. She compared that with our bilingual local population, as well as with our non-bilingual local population. Okay, so the hypothesis was that it crossed the language interactions over a lifetime can make some meanings that for a monolingual aren't that prominent, but if they're co-activated, like that weapons meaning of arms, if it's through a lifetime co-activated, you see it across two languages, maybe it becomes a more prominent part of your, of your overall understanding of that word. So that could lead to richer word meanings and really a lot more uncertainty. <laughs> if, you're, if you're bilingual, um, one of the prices we pay for this richer experience is there's more uncertainty. Because if I'm getting exposed to meanings more frequently due to being exposed to more than one language, it ups the uncertainty. So for an English monolingual, arms is mostly the body part, but maybe not so for a bilingual of English and Spanish. Maybe it's a more ambiguous word because you're exposed more to both meanings. Okay. So um, this is kind of summarizing what I already said. So I'm going to skip. They saw English homonyms. They were cognates with Spanish, meaning they looked similar in form. And one of the meanings was shared with Spanish. And so she calculated the probability um, with which participants in our local population produced either the shared meaning, such as weapons, or the non-shared meaning, um, new, the new meaning of novel is not shared with Spanish. And she compared it with the, mono, the published monolingual data. Okay, so she predicted there'd be a higher probability of shared meanings produced by bilinguals relative to how often those same meanings were produced by monolinguals. Okay, so the table. Let's go piece by piece here. What we have are um, words that based on the publication, based on monolinguals, you, these are homonyms that you could classify as either having um, the meaning was either dominant. So the dominant meaning of arms would be, um, you know, um, the body part. Then you have some meanings that are more uh, mid-range and then you have some meanings that are subordinate, that are weaker. And so for the words that we selected, when we looked at the monolinguals data that was already published, we found that um, overall 19% of those of the meanings um, produced were those that would be classified as dominant. And 47% um, would be classified as subordinate. But what's critical is now comparing it to our other groups locally. What I want you to notice is the top row. The, and these are the monolinguals. These are our local monolingual participants. So the ones who um, are exposed to Spanish but aren't really proficient Spanish speakers, but they're exposed to it. What you're um, noticing is that um, they, they, the pattern is now different. So more of the meanings are classified as dominant based on their responses relative to uh, the monolinguals. I know 19 and 23 doesn't seem like a big gap, but statistically um, we're gonna talk about differences that are reliable. And then critically, the bilingual responses, what we see here is that more of the meanings are spread out. So what you have is there's a more even spread of responses that um, are either dominant or mid-range. So what this means is that for meanings that for a monolingual are rarely produced, they would be considered kind of subordinate, they're more likely to be um, produced more frequently by a bilingual, and so they're more likely to be classified as either mid-range or dominant. And so this shows that a lifetime of cross-language activation causes um, some meanings to be more readily available in memory and therefore a more prominent feature 
of what that word means to a person. Okay, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing good. All right. Can't believe I got this far. Okay, awesome. Okay, a little break. A little, you get a three second mental break. I have shown you, hopefully, examples of the way, ways, first of all, you know, we now know, right? You can, one thing you can say to your family when you go home, well, maybe you are home because this is COVID. Um, hey, the multiple languages of a bilingual, we can't turn them on and off, and they're always interactive. And that's actually cool and awesome because it affords more than one route to learn information. Um, it can give a little boost in processing speed. It can make the mental representations of words richer. Um, and so now, this is the last latest study from my lab, the one that I'm still writing up, I'm about finishing up now. And here we dared, and this is tough to do in a laboratory study, we went, not only did we go beyond single word processing, not only did we go beyond single sentence processing, we looked at discourse processing. And in this study, we examined whether um, encountering texts, entire texts, whether you encounter them just one language or another language has an impact on a comprehender's ability to integrate information across those texts. Okay, so learners in the real world, <laughs> we learn concepts over time and it's from an accumulation of experiences and an accumulation of integrating information across different sources. So this cloud here, this thought cloud just represents a concept. And if we, if we speak scholastically, and we're focusing on the life of a classroom learner, let's say someone in K through 12, their concept of, let's say, photosynthesis, okay, is garnered from multiple sources and oftentimes across different texts, for example. And what happens is this information across texts must be incorporated into an integrated whole. And the, another source could be magazines, TVs, this is how we learn about things. We learn things from very different types of sources. Now our focus will be specifically on the consequences of when you encounter a new concept from different sources that are all different texts. That's gonna be the focus here. So we're thinking of your typical scenario of a classroom learner. Thing is, bilinguals are different than monolinguals. And I want you to appreciate where I'm living. I am in a very monolingual country. <laughs> Um, everything is based on the monolingual model. Uh, I live in a city that is unlike the rest of the United States, completely unlike it. Most of our schools are bilingual programs. That is not the truth for even places in Southern California or Florida. So I want you to appreciate that for multilingual speakers in these classrooms, not only might they encounter information across different texts, but some of those texts might be in different languages especially here on the border because we're right on the border and you walk out I walk outside of my door and I'm just as likely to hear English as I am Spanish and so we wanted to see if there's any impact on the ability to integrate information across different texts if they're in the same or different language and I put up uh, Portuguese there as well to recognize that I am speaking to a large uh, audience from Brazil okay all right so I'm going to give you a little primer. I have uh, 10 minutes to go through this, but I think I can do it. Um, the literature on discourse processing is very, very hard to understand. <laughs> but I'm going to try and summarize it so that just enough so you can understand what it is that we discovered. OK, but this part of this talk could actually be a talk in and of itself. I want you first to realize that when you read let's say a chapter in a textbook or an article, a research article, because most of your graduate students and you're reading articles in, in, in research articles, what you walk away from, hopefully, the ideal, you walk away with an abstract representation of the overall meaning of what it is that you read. So you read a research article, you walk away with, this is what they found. 
And it's also incorporated, that memory trace includes information that you incorporated from your prior knowledge, your general world knowledge. That is the optimal end result of someone who has successfully created a discourse representation. But there's many steps to get there. Okay, so imagine you're reading a text. And I'm going to keep things simple. Let's, even though I was just using something like what graduate students do, let's just use the uh, idea of a high schooler or a middle schooler who's learned about photosynthesis or the planets. So they're reading a text and they're going along forward in a text. As we go through a text, what we do is we first build little mini representations of sections of text. And so maybe the first paragraph is about, oh gosh, now am I going to make myself remember photosynthesis? Maybe I should choose a different topic. <laughs> um, but whatever subtopic, this first set of, usually it's paragraph by paragraph, we build little representations of the meaning of individual, usually corresponds to paragraphs. And what we do is we try to make all the statements in a paragraph cohere. And this is called, your fancy word is a text base. That's the text base is the term used that refers to a reader's mental representation of a local area of text, a paragraph. It has to be coherent. Everything in the paragraph is coherent. And in, as we go through a text, just so you can appreciate how hard it is to read, look at all the things you have to do. You create one step, one piece of your text, one text base. And what you do is you extract from that text base just a tiny portion of that information and you decide whether you're going to incorporate it and keep it into a larger representation of the entire text. What some scientists call the situation model. And psycholinguists, we love to confuse our readers. So we come up with 10 different terms for the same thing. Some people also call it a discourse representation. So sorry, not my fault. People use different terms. So as you're doing it, it's kind of like you're building a castle, but you gotta go step by step. So you progress. Now you do your next text base and you decide what part, if any, should go into your situation model. And you have to make sure that whatever you put in your situation model, which is your whole representation of the text, coheres. And you move forward like that. I want you to appreciate this requires a lot of integration, which is not cognitively easy. You have to make sure that you can integrate information across different paragraphs, that they all cohere, they all fit together, and that this becomes part of your bigger representation. And what's tricky is, and so those little circle arrows just represent integrating, integrating, you have to integrate, which is cognitively difficult. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that the research with monolinguals has demonstrated that even though you do eventually walk away with a, rep a discourse representation that focuses just on the overall meaning of a text, it turns out that, let me go backwards here, that there's also a role that is played by the superficial wording so the more that superficial wording overlaps across texts or parts of a text, the more easily it gets integrated. And therefore we know that even the discourse representation might, how well you can create that can be shaped by how similar the wording was across different parts of text. That's for monolinguals. And, but what about bilinguals who might encounter texts in entirely different languages? And so I'm gonna to jump to that because I have five minutes. And so our overall approach is participants sat, we put them on an eye tracker, so their chin's on a chin rest, there's a camera tracking their eye movements and they're presented with a text, but it is chopped in half. So first they see one part of the text. And what we did was we presented them with science texts with made up terms, fake science. So we presented them with um, the science texts that introduced 
two new scientific terms, which we completely made up, and each term had an associated fact. Um, my, my student definitely can have a career in, um, in, in um, sci-fi writing. So one of the words was Adelam. We made that up. And we said, oh, this is a special type of telescope. Or it can measure radiation from stars. Completely made up. And then the other term was Arapis. Completely made up. There was some sort of special star. What we did was the critical manipulation. Then they were... Then they read a second passage, the second part of that text. And we mentioned the terms again. And then for one of the terms, the second passage just kind of reiterates what they already learned. Hey, it's a device. It measures radiation from stars. Critically, the other term, we said, hey, you know what? We used to think that this star was old, but it turns out it's young. And here's why. So now this is hard, even for just one language, even for really proficient, highly educated readers, this is cognitively demanding. You're le learning a new term and now you have to update and overwrite what you just encoded in order to walk away with the correct overall discourse model. So this was a tough task. And then afterwards, there's a little, they played Sudoku for like 15 minutes or something. And then they were given true false questions and we looked at their ability to correctly answer true false questions. And some of those questions um, related to a, the fact that was kept consistent. And some of them related to the fact regarding the term where, oops, we said Arapis was old, but turns out it was new. And looking at their ability to say, you know, to have updated the information according to the second passage. So what's critical here is that second passage. It's in the second passage where the term that has to be revised, that's where the revision was presented. And because we are ambitious, we manipulated everything. We manipulated the language of the first part of the text. We manipulated the language of the second part of the text. And because we love complex analyses, we also manipulated the language of the question. So graduate students, um, I'm not an evil mentor, but yes, this was a two by two by two design. <laughs> um, I do have a simple way of conveying the results. <laughs> so basically, I'm just going to show you the results that speak to specific comparisons we were interested in. We looked at whether um, the ability to answer those questions correctly, if it was influenced by whether the first part of the passage and the, sick, the second part of the passage, whether they're in the same language or not. So we, one, very, one factor was, hey, will comprehension be affected by whether the two passages are in the same or different language? Then the other critical um, question we asked was, we were also specifically interested in the match between that second passage, because that's where the revised information was, and whether it matched with the language of the question. Why? Because if you think about it, for the, for the term whose fact had to be revised, you want to know if the language of encoding, like, oh my gosh, wait, it's not a new star, it's an old one, if it matches the language of retrieval. We wanted to know if that mattered. And you'll see it does. That matters the most. Um, I'm going to skip the participants. Just know they were half of our participants were dominant in English and half were in Spanish. That's the beauty of living on the border, split right down the middle. They're all highly proficient bilinguals, though. Um, the results, I just want you to remind you of the two major questions we wanted to know. We wanted to know about the influence of the match between the two passages and the influence of the match between the second passage and the language of recall. What's interesting is the match in language across passages had absolutely no effect on comprehension overall. It didn't matter if half of the text was in one language and the other half in another language. Performance was the same relative to if it was all in the same language. So that's beautiful, right? Proficient bilinguals can easily integrate information across passages. So that arrow just went away because it had no effect. What we found was a critical effect 
on the match between the language of the second passage, the language of encoding, and the language of, quest of the question retrieval. And what's really important is that this effect was only observed for the words, those made up terms, where they had to revise a fact, where they had to say, oh wait, it's not young, it's old. The, the match between the second passage and the language of the question did not matter for consistent facts. For consistent facts, they did beautifully. Um, so I just want to show you real quick. Um, you see all these bars, they're all about the same height. <laughs> uh, basically, um, what this shows is that no matter the language of the question, whether it was in their dominant or weaker language, um, no matter um, if it was, so here we see that for consistent facts, it didn't matter if the, if the passages were in different or same languages, they, they did great. Things got interesting with inconsistent, the facts that had to be revised. And here I'm gonna try and go a little quick, even though it gets complicated here. What we found is that for the facts that had to be revised, there was, uh, even though it looks tiny, it was statistically reliable. There was an effect of whether the passages were in the same or different language. Specifically, they did worse overall if the passages were in a different language. So we had to unpack that and look at what was really going on. This is what was really going on. I'm sorry that it's a complicated thing. I'm gonna try and make it easy. Read the headline. The headline is, there was a cost in performance on those questions. When the language of the test question was different than the language of the second passage. This cost, remember, is only for the facts that had to be revised. I have put in a red bright font the two bars that represent the case where the second passage was in a different language than the question. You will notice that in both cases where there's the word different, that bar is shorter than the bar next to it, where the, the match, where the languages are the same between the second passage and the question. And I do want you to look at this. This is horrible performance. This is almost at floor. This is like complete confusion. And in this particular case, what's happening? This is what's happening. They read as the second passage. And in this case, it was in their weaker language. And that's where they have to revise the fact that the stars are not young, they're old. And they're encoding it in their weaker language. And then they get tested in their dominant language. And it's a tremendous cost. This is horrible performance. This is really at floor. Um, what this suggests is that when we're talking about new concepts, which are hard to learn from text, there might be a cost if the language of encoding and retrieval are not the same. And that's something that we have to bear in mind. So some conclusions, literacy in two languages affords a richer language experience. You have more avenues to develop effective learning strategies. We saw that with the text structure strategy. We have more ways to learn about concepts and opportunities to integrate different sets of features. So a word like arms becomes different for us if we're a speaker of Spanish as well as English. Proficiency in multiple languages leads to qualitatively different activation and competition dynamics relative to monolinguals. Proficient bilinguals readily integrate information across languages, except in cases of really challenging material. Educators, students, and stakeholders need to be cognizant of the language diversity of their students. The language in which we encode information and rehearse information needs to be brought to bear when we later want to assess students. And this is the big one. And this is the this is the lifelong goal here, is that people truly understand that the benefits of bilingualism are only possible when it's supported in the environment. I live in a very monolingual country and a very monolingual, the school systems here 
they're not integrated. Everything is local school districts, but most of them are very monolingual English only. And heritage speakers, students who come to the classroom who speak a language in the home other than English, they get no reward or credit for knowing those words in that language. The literacy in that language is, is hardly ever supported. They're not high stakes tested in their heritage language. They're only high stakes tested in English. And so often you will find increasingly through generations that any literacy in their home language dissipates by the second or third generation. And so that would be need, require a whole restructuring of um, the school system to support two literacies. And I think that's all I have. I went a little bit over. Thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. Students are sending their commentaries. You were very didactic, and the topic is also great, bilingualism, right? So uh, thank you very much. Very informative talk. And we have plenty of questions. I'll have to choose some. I don't think we have time for all of them. Uh, I'm already sorry for oh, that, no. but uh, I'll pick some questions. So um, I'll start with the first one that uh, Professor Alison Gonçalves made. So uh, he says that his question is a little bit off topic, but he would like you as a specialist in bilingualism to say what do you think about the reports about the decreasing number of students learning foreign or additional languages in the US. Right, so that's the outcome of politics um, and resource allocation. Um, a lot of our curriculum is getting skinny down. It's, it's now focusing on science, math, social studies. The arts are um, being put aside. Um, it's not just at K through 12, but also at the university level. Um, departments have been skinny down. And so, you know, our foreign language curriculum was never top priority anyway. So, it, but it's sad to see it go even further down. And yeah, so we have just, it, I think it's similar to what could be the possible consequence of the children in K through 12, not having as much opportunity to have art class to not um, have as much opportunity to read great literary works in English class. Um, you know, we're just decreasing exposure because it's not, it's not valued. Um, people don't see market value in learning a foreign language, which is pretty funny because you think about the number of speakers of Spanish worldwide. Um, and, and I know there's more speakers of Chinese, but in terms of spread, Spanish is the most spread language. Um, and so it's kind of ironic. Um, yeah, we're just going to have more and more of a monolingual model. So uh, and then the next question is also about L2 teaching. Uh, so Danielle Santos Vicentiner asked, Professor Schwartz, in your point of view, what are the constraints on L2 lexical development in instructional settings? Okay. So here are the constraints. It depends. Are we living in Holland, Belgium? There's no constraints. Let's go to Holland and Belgium and ask what their constraints are. Oh, there's none, right? So they're literate in at least English, Dutch, um, often French. And why is that? because the structure of um, whatever the high stakes testing is, is consistent with um, and requires a development of literacy across more than one language system. I imagine um, one way that gets executed is perhaps the timeline in which certain literary or lexical skills are expected to peak might be more spread out. Whereas, um, again, I can't speak firsthand about what the school system tests for in Europe, but I know in the United States by first grade, and I'm pretty sure this was not true 20 years ago. Now, even in kindergarten, they're expecting word attack skills and whole word recognition by kindergarten. 
And when these are not present to in first grade, they're already um, separated into different groups. And we already know that um, ability grouping, which we're not supposed to do, still gets done in some way, shape, or form. And so then you have this nice little self-perpetuating cycle where the multilingual speaker, the, the child who is being exposed to two different phonemic systems, at least two, maybe three, who knows, um, you know, there's going to be a little bit more time to master those phoneme to grapheme correspondences, which later become part of your lex lexical representation. If the system does not allow for the flexibility and time for those to develop, if we're already high stakes testing them and now instructing them differently based on their performance in first grade, then there's the cutoff. There's the limit. In the United States, the limit's set very early. Um, and as a parent, what you're going to do is make sure that your kid is reading only in English because you don't have time, because the child has to have sight word, fast word attack skills by the end of first grade. So that's and I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't see that changing anytime soon. The, the world is just becoming increasingly globalized. So I, I don't think, I think that's just gonna keep heading, keep heading in that direction. Of course, families have access to lots of resources um, and can send their kids to camps or enrichment programs in the summer. Sky's the limit. Right. So, uh, Fernanda Alves asks, Professor Schwartz, in the first research you talked about, the students were in an immersion context. Do you think that the results would be similar in a foreign country, language context, for example, learning English in Brazil? Okay, so if they're in a foreign language context and we deliver the, um, there's a possibility that by virtue of having the languages more disparate in context, that um, maybe they become more tied to one language, but I doubt it. I still think that um, if you can develop a strategy, especially in your weaker language, it appears that readers will, or learners in general, will spontaneously transfer that to their dominant language. Now, if we had done it where we instructed them in their dominant language and looked whether it transferred to their weaker language, I think there that not being immersed might have an effect. So if we, if you learned the strategy, um, yeah, so imagine you learned the strategy, you're going to school in Brazil and you learn the strategy using Portuguese, 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 Portuguese. And now you take your, let's not even use English because I think in Brazil, um, the English language curriculum is important. In most countries, they pay more attention to that. But what if you're taking Chinese or French as a foreign language? I think there might be far less likely that they would transfer the strategy spontaneously. If, you know, I only use French in the classroom, you know, I don't use it beyond there. There I might, I think we would might see a limit in how naturally people transfer strategies. Is it true in Brazil that English is an important cl class? I know in Spanish, it, in Spain, it was like an important class. You had to do well in English. Well, we have English uh, for public schools. English starts in the fifth grade, the, oh, where, okay. yeah, in which kids are like 11. Oh, so okay. it is mandatory to have the English discipline in the curriculum, but okay. they only have one class a week. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Unfortunately, our results show that kids uh, leave school without right. having a good knowledge of the language. Right. Even though they start studying English in the fifth grade and continue until the last year in high school, the results right. are not the ones we would like to have. Right. That's what I figure. Yeah. So, Professor Mayus made a question. She's uh, asking about the study reported, Laudo and Chivas 2018. So, she asks, did you see any facts related to the position of the cognate noun? Yes, what a perfect, it sounds like um, she also has expertise 
in um, anaphoric referencing and knows that there's a preference for, um, what, what do they call it? The more distal versus close attachment, I'm forgetting the terms. Um, we found consistent with other research with monolinguals that the effect was bigger if it was the head noun. Because people have a, if the first noun was a cognate versus just the second noun, the benefit of cognate status was even greater. So that first noun was encoded. Gernsbacher would say that that's because there's that, um, that we use the first noun as the foundation of how we represent a sentence. And what we found was consistent with how Gernsbacher views this. Um, more so than, I know in, in linguistics, they talk about high versus low attachment preferences. And in English, there's a low attachment preference. In Spanish, there's a high attachment preference. Um, these were all in English. And despite the fact that in English, theoretically, we have a low attachment preference, um, our results are more in line with Gernsbacher that the head noun becomes the basis of the foundation of the structure. And so cognate status was more influential if the head noun was a cognate. So I think I need to choose some of the questions now. I because I, 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 this is fun. I, I'm having a hot day here. <laughs> because people keep posting questions in the chat. I don't think awesome. we will be able to answer all of them. So, um, well, I'll pick one here. Uh, Pedro Ricardo Bean asks, to Professor Spatz, how do you understand the debate between bilingual executive functions oh. versus monolingual executive yeah. functions? Okay, I have a lot to say. It's not my topic, but since you asked, um, I have many opportunities to speak with people who are front and center of this research, such as Ellen Bialystok. And first of all, a minority of scientists have kind of taken on this topic and boiled it down to phrases that don't capture what it really is. Um, ideally, we no longer just use this catchphrase, the bilingual advantage. It's better thought of as cognitive consequences of multilingual experience. And if you look at the latest studies um, and Bialystok's work and others, what she is finding is it's more about, first of all, a lot of the research goes on Miyake's model of what working memory is. And that model is not necessarily a valid model of working memory, but it's what we use of, you know, it, it pretends to compartmentalize working memory into different functions, even though mathematically in the paper itself, it doesn't really hold up that way. And so she invites people to not just rely on Miyake's model of working memory, but what seems to be, it's a difference in attention in how bilinguals versus monolinguals allocate attention and how they control attention. And the debate seems to me to be more of a straw man issue. It's not really a debate because it's being misrepresented. Um, it's more about understanding the complex and nuanced ways, some, in some cases nuanced, in which experience, different degrees of bilingual experience will lead to different types of consequences in cognitive functioning, in general cognitive functioning. Um, but I, I do feel that you can really integrate the resources, the different publications out there. If you have this more general idea of it's it's not that you're always going to see an advantage in, let's say, a flanker task. Um, but rather, it's about this more general how attention is deployed and how attention is um, sustained. And then some of the studies that theoretically falsify the advantage have some serious flaws to them as well. I think the, the evidence is really convincing. Um, I mean, you even have evidence of differences in gray matter and white matter. <laughs> I mean, all sorts of differences when comparing um, those exposed to more than one language versus not. Um, but yeah, definitely keep your finger on the pulse of the latest um, articulations of what has been called the bilingual advantage, which might kind of be an unfortunate way of terming it. Great. So uh, I'll join two questions that are from my advisees. 
Uh, one of them is about interlingual homographs and the other one about interlingual homophones or words that have similar pronunciations among, uh, between the two languages. So they want to see uh, what hypothesis you make for these types of words yeah. based yeah. on the cognate effects. So it's really fascinating. Um, it seems that when you look at the literature overall and the effects of homophone, interlingual homophone, homograph versus cognate status are in different worlds. You, it's almost qualitatively different. What's the key difference? Semantics. Um, the language system is a meaning hungry system. We always go for meaning. And there's something very different about a pair of words that share meaning versus do not. Therefore, when you look across the literature um, that came out in the 90s, effects of homograph and homophone status, while present at times, are not as consistently observed. And they're easily eliminated in when those homographs or homophones are embedded in a task that forces meaning. So if it's a sentence comprehension task, uh, anything where the orientation of processing is more on, I have to walk away with a meaningful representation of what I just read, I have to integrate across words, you will see those homophone and homograph effects um, be eliminated. Whereas cognate effects tend to still stand. And it's, it's because if it's a more meaning generated task, um, meaning dependent, well, you have shared meaning in the cognates and therefore you can think of it as that top-down activation. There's something really powerful about the top-down activation dynamics from semantics down to word form that persists even across tasks where the words are either presented in isolation or in a sentence. Now, oh, what's exciting is the latest research showing that even cognates in tasks. So um, I have a paper under revision right now where we looked at the nature of the cognate benefit when they're embedded in paragraphs. And there's this emerging science that's coming out showing that when the task requires integration, okay, then even your cognate benefit effects go away. Once you are dealing with integration that goes beyond a word, it seems that the language system, the lexical system is able to operate at certain points in time more selectively. Okay. But it is true, those homographs and homophones, I think the critical difference is the power of meaning. We are meaning hungry. We go to meaning. When meaning is not shared, those types of dynamics, maybe they are co-activated, but not strongly enough to influence processing in an observable way. Awesome. So thank you very much for this very informative and so it will help a lot in the studies of my research group and from other laboratories as well. So uh, I'll pick one last question because of time and it has to be on a Fonti's question, right? <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> So, uh, Ana asked, would the finding of this last study, the language match between the second passage and language of the questions facilitating the response, be related to the encoding specific specificity principle? Yeah, yeah you know, Ana, I, I think, and, the, and when, I read, when I wrote up, I'm working on the discussion right now, I do kind of see it as encoding uh, I think see it as encoding specificity, I think more so than transfer appropriate processing. I think it's a beautiful example of the principle of encoding um, specificity. And that only occurred to me now that I'm trying to get it ready for um, manuscript submission. I think that is what's going on. And it it's just a more powerful example of it than people could demonstrate with monolinguals. Because there's actually a lot of studies that were performed over... Oof, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, looking at whether wording overlap for monolinguals um, had an impact in how much they integrate information. And lo and behold, they found some evidence that, yeah, the more overlap in wording, 
um, the more strongly activated the representation would be. But it's such a more powerful way of demonstrating it when you can look at the effect across languages. I think it's definitely in line with the encoding specificity principle. And it would be really cool is what if we gave the learners enough opportunities to rehearse the information, rehearse test, rehearse test, rehearse test. You would think that once they reach a certain depth of the concept, this new concept that has more depth and richness, maybe encoding specificity will no longer influence retrieval because the form specificity no longer matters. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, and you and I need to co-author again. We need to figure out what we're gonna do together here. I'm happy to take more questions. It's up to you guys when you have to end your session. I'm fine with whatever. Yeah, well, I think we can have at least one more question. Okay. <laughs> so Lucival Araújo asked, what are the implica main implications of your research for contemporary bilingual education? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I need to contextualize a little bit this question because at least here in Fortaleza, it's very common now for the private schools to have a bilingual program. So they have English in their curriculum the most they can. So I think this question about bilingual education is much related to this uh, fashion now. The yeah. schools want to have a bilingual program. Okay, so, and here you wanna also look at the work and papers written recently uh, by my friend and colleague Gigi Luck. So a topic near and dear to our hearts is the confounding with SDS. So what you see, so it's private schools, right? So when the resources are set in place, like here in, in the United States, it's also a fashion now where out in the higher SES neighborhoods in the middle of Kansas, children are learning Chinese. So they're in these bilingual programs that parents get to select, you know, well, they get to learn Mandarin. Um, sometimes Mandarin, Spanish, and English. And they're in this wonderful context where the, um, they have resources at home and in the community that support their education. Um, and they never get high stakes tested in Chinese. So when they go to apply for college or um, here in the United States, in many states, you have to pass a certain exam to get promoted to secondary school. They're not getting high stakes tested in Chinese. So it's great. However, let's contrast that with, with the heritage speaker, which we have in the United States. That heritage speaker probably is more proficient in their Spanish than the non-heritage speaker is in Chinese. However, both students will be high stakes tested in English. And unfortunately, the United States is still the, the fact that many, that Spanish in the home is still confounded with SES. And so then what you have is the heritage speaker gets no credit for being bilingual in their heritage language. The non-heritage speaker just gets credit and exposure and it's lovely and it's great for them cognitively, it's great for those kids because they won't be high stakes tested in it. Um, and so it's great. They get this enrichment. It's beautiful. And ideally, it, it just shows what the human mind, the, our language system, I think, and this is just me speculating, I think the human language system actually evolved to handle more than one communication system. And that's not really, you know how they call it bilingual benefit? It's not a bilingual benefit. It's a monolingual deficit. Look globally. Most speakers speak more than one language, and that's true historically. I think the language system, the neurocircuitry of the language system evolved to um, handle multiple phonemic systems. And if your, your private school example in the communities in Brazil is an example of what is normal and what can happen, what is normal acquisition when the resources are in place? Because uh, you just said it was a private school. Um, again, we have to look at all these places in Europe. I mean, have you ever seen a Dutch speaker speak English? And they all, by the time they're in university, 
You know, they're not made different from the rest of us. <laughs> so, um, I would like to thank you very much for this talk, but I, I have to ask you for a final answer of a final question together with your final words for the audience. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. So the final question, I think it's, uh, it fits well, would be for uh, what would you suggest for the future studies regarding bilingual language activation? So, uh, yeah, so where, and this is what, this is my, um, you know, when you have a personal reckoning of where you want to go next, um, I'm excited by the emerging evidence that a language at some point is selected. And um, my next set of studies, and I think, and I, I invite people like Tom Dijkstra, who's one of the best modelers the best model of bilingualism out there. I invite him to think about his latest model and situations in which the system might actually be able to operate language, more language selectively. So now we know that both language systems are fundamentally available for activation. Now we want to know under which situations can activation be streamlined to one language system because there is evidence it's emerging now and it is exciting. I think we should now look at kind of like the borders of non-selectivity. Um, I wanna just recommend, sometimes you wanna look at your past publications in the past to be inspired for the future. A paper by Elston Gutler, if you just put in the zoom in hypothesis, I think that's what we should start going. We're examining more fully in what situations can the bilingual system actually zoom in to a language which was initially proposed back in the 90s by Elson Gutler? So uh, do you have a final word for the audience? Um, you know, just let's keep up our, our work and get out that how important that, that bilingualism, multilingualism, just like biculturalism and multiculturalism is an essential component of being human. Um, and to produce that data that backs it up. And for all the graduate students out there, follow your heart. I know I've taught Anna this, follow the, the research question that is your heart because it's been over 20 years since I was a graduate student. And there were many papers that I was like, they, they never got out, you know, lots of rejections, lots of this, lots of this, lots of, oh, I'll never make it in this field. This is too hard. But I did stick to following my heart and pursuing the questions that excited me. And it's well worth it in the end. And remember, it's not just, we're not bean counters. It's not just the number of publications you do. It's the impact you have and whether you can sleep at night knowing that your science can make a difference. Also, thank you for this advice. Also for the graduate students, thank you again very much for accepting to take part in this panel. Had a blast. <laughs> thank you. It was a lovely talk. Thank and you. I'm very sorry for the questions that I couldn't make. Please. They can email me. Yes. That's Please. fine. I don't care. I, 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 can, I can answer an email. And I can say that she answers and she, she has answered and helped me a lot. So I encourage you to send her emails. So thank you again. Thank you, and Bob. thank you for the audience for being with us today. And next week, I hope you all for the next talk, September 17th, the same time. Okay. So bye. Bye. Ciao.